The high school at North Star Academy is about 650 students. It serves all uh, mostly low-income students from Newark. You have to be a resident of Newark to be able to attend. Uh, most of our students come from our middle schools, uh, which we benefit by because they're run in sort of the same fashion. And then now we have about 4,000 students in Newark in elementary school, middle school, and high school. It's a college-going mission. So wherever our students are, whether they're general education, special education, the mission is we need to do whatever whatever we need to do so that they can be prepared to go off and succeed in four-year schools. And then we make all of our decisions on that basis, set up the systems within our schools to achieve that, and then still monitor them after they've gone off to college. And that is the mission of the school, to just create a normal atmosphere that is not filled with heroes or superstars, just normal teachers who are working together within a system, all of which have the decisions pointed at student performance. And I don't think that is true in most schools. I think there's a lot of teacher autonomy in most schools. There's not a unified direction or vision of what is trying to be accomplished, or the school is trying to, to please everybody. But that is not what we're trying to do at North Star. We're trying to get the students well prepared, fast, in a highly disciplined fashion to be prepared to do well in college. And so we've narrowed the focus somewhat towards those outcomes. And we sometimes have to say no. Like, no, we're not going to go in that direction or we're not going to offer that program because it's not core to our mission. We are also a learning organization, so we try to get better and better. We try to learn from other schools, learn from our own failures. We've had many failures, but we try to learn from those and make different decisions and uh, to use data to inform all those decisions. So we're not operating off of hunches or anecdotes, but on actually what teachers and students are um, succeeding in or failing in so that we can maximize more success. For North Star, in the absence of a state test that is highly rigorous, we have chosen to put all of our eggs in the basket of the College Board. And so we focus on the SAT and advanced placement courses pretty specifically because those are nationally recognized, colleges understand them, they are highly rigorous. So we have backwards planned our curriculum in order to succeed on by those measures. And it's worked very well. We have among the highest percentage of students in the state of New Jersey in advanced placement classes. In fact, we're number five out of more than 400 high schools in terms of advanced placement participation. Our students do quite well on advanced placement exams, not as well as some of the uh, wealthier suburbs of Newark. You know, they'll have, gradu they'll have pass rates of 95% on advanced placement, but maybe only 25 or 30% of their students in those courses. We have greater than 70% of our juniors and seniors taking majority of advanced placement classes. We have juniors in BC Calculus who are going to get fours and fives on that and being multivariable calculus as seniors. Uh, because we have backwards planned this to, to get that level of success. So these scores are higher in many cases than the, the wealthy suburbs that surround Newark in Essex County, which is one of the wealthiest counties in New Jersey. One of the benefits of uh, being in a school like North Star is that over time we can create systems that then remain, whether those systems are about training teachers or using data. Once we establish those, we like to keep them going and have everybody use them so that we can then design new things to solve new problems. That's how we've gotten better over time. So one thing we noticed um, when we were studying our alumni, that we have hard data on how our alumni are doing, because we pay them for their grades, essentially, through book scholarships, is that uh, the ones with lower college and, as a result, they had lower high school GPAs, they were having the biggest problems in college. We knew that if their GPAs were higher before they graduated, uh, our data was indicating that with those skills and habits and the knowledge from those higher GPAs, they would have a greater persistence rate. And so we uh, d decided to tackle that. So we identified all of our students in 10th, 11th, 12th grades who had a GPA below 2.5, put them in one class, took them out of some other things that they were doing, and proceeded to concentrate on helping them analyze those grades and the causes of why they were doing so poorly. 
and really directing their attention to the problem on a regular basis with me. So they knew that they needed to take it seriously because I was helping them do that. And I could do it with large groups at a time, like 70 or 80 students. And then we, over time, developed a process where they would analyze their grades using real-time data, analyze the sources of the cause of the problem, whether it was low homework uh, percentage or absences, uh, and so they never turned the work in the first place, or low quiz and test averages, whatever the cause was, and then we would put them into small groups, train them how to analyze each other's grades so that they could hold each other accountable to this process, and then they would create SMART goals, um, specific, measurable, timely goals for every week in order to take just small steps towards improvement. And uh, we did this twice a week for every week until they had a GPA that was above 2.5. And it's not, you know, it's not terribly innovative. It's not brain surgery. It was just reflection. It was just regular reflection on areas of both high and low performance, but especially the low performance, so that students would be regularly reminded through the data rather than through just nagging or encouragement or vague things. It was through specific data about what they needed to do in order to solve their own problems. And then we would highlight students who were doing really well with this, and we would grill students publicly in front of their peers who were not doing well and make them explain why they weren't, all of which was just to encourage them to own their performance in high school before they left us. And they're not surrounded by their systems or their parents or their friends, and they're alone. We wanted them to learn how to solve it in high school before they left. And so that, has, that really benefited a great number of students. And sometimes it took more than a semester or two. Sometimes uh, it would take four or five semesters of a student doing this with me. And as they got older and got more serious about life, before they really internalized the process. But once they've, if they've internalized it before they leave, that was the goal. Is it was to both increase their GPA when they were here, but also to give them just normal adult skills of reflecting on areas of suboptimal performance and then finding the little things that they could do to address it and then to see that incremental progress over time. So we would make them chart all of this. We would make them reflect on the charting. We would make them go into power school and find out the specific reasons for the low percentages in these areas and really hold them accountable to that. And you would think that, that would work. And as it turns out, it does. But for a lot of our students in the past, they would never confront their own problems. And we didn't have a way to help them do that. And so this was a way where they had to do that on a regular basis. And it worked so well that we now do that with all freshmen. Up until a few years ago, we did do less well in STEM areas. But since we vastly increased the number of students in advanced placement uh, science and math classes, we have, we have closed that gap. So our students in college are actually doing equally well in the humanities and in STEM fields. And I think that's because of the advanced placement experience that we have. Plus, our middle schools keep getting better and better for all the reasons I've described too. Just the systems that we built, the very intense lesson planning that we have teachers do, uh, very specific ways that we use data to analyze results, all that happens in our middle schools also. So those students keep coming to us ready to perform at a higher level. So we will, next year, for example, we will have ninth graders, some ninth graders, in AP US history, which we have not done before. And this year was the first year when we had juniors taking BC calculus. At North Star, we try to listen to our alumni's experiences as they come back to us and tell them, tell us how they're doing. And they do complain about a few predictable things. One is that they haven't had enough chance to explore themselves or other things that they might be interested in other than advanced placement courses. And they also say that they are underprepared for the predominantly white institutions that most of them go to. And so through High School 2.0, we've tried to provide more interesting experiences for them to do, for them to explore their own interests, but also to do lab research 
at universities which are near us. We have students doing lab research at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab every Friday. They take the train down to Princeton and uh, do research in the lab. We have students working at NJIT and at Rutgers in the labs. So they're getting to know graduate students. They're getting to know professors. And a lot of these uh, professors and graduate students are actually people of color who are great role models because they're here in Newark. It's a great uh, way for our students to see what is really possible for them, not just the humanities, but STEM fields. Um, and then in terms of helping them get ready for predominantly white institutions, that's harder for us because there are no white students who go to our school. Um, but we have, we have established a relationship with the high-performing high school that is nearby, that is predominantly white, and that has allowed us to have our students attend classes there. We've, we've started to embed some students for three or four days at a time so they can feel what it's like. And so that the shock of that feeling of isolation, which is normal, or that, that shock of feeling um, singled out as, a, as the only black person in class, so that they can feel that before they go off and they're alone and they have to experience nine different cultural shifts all at once. At North Star, our students have a class for seven hours a day, uh, and each class is an hour, um, but those minutes are really squeezed. So they will, there are timers in every classroom that are ticking almost constantly with every component of class. So whether it's the do now that is four minutes, or the independent practice that's seven minutes, or uh, the turn and talk, which is 30 seconds. A lot of the components of class are just really fast. It helps our teachers stay on track, and, it, and, and in fact, it helps our students stay focused and on track too. Our lesson plans are written by the minute. So these lesson plans move fast. And, it's, um, and, and what it has allowed us to do over time is just really maximize every second, every minute that we have in the school. But what it doesn't do is prepare students to experience the absence of that. And so High School 2.0 has been our attempt to do a mashup between some time that is devoted to project-based learning, which is inherently messy and not as structured or timely, uh, without losing anything that we've already established or gained through the structured use of of efficiency in minutes. One of the problems that we have had and um, didn't do a good job of solving was what to do with students who are coming into our high school who'd never gone to our middle schoolers, schools or who are coming into our high school at the 10th or 11th grade without any of our middle school preparation. Uh, in the past, we had kind of just um, told them to try harder. <laughs> and to do their homework and to and we would tell their parents the same thing and sometimes it would work out and sometimes it wouldn't and they just kind of flail along we didn't have a great solution we would have tutorials they exist throughout the school on a regular basis and we would have teachers pay attention to them but there was no systematic solution so this year we had more students come in in that way than usual and I was afraid that it was going to cause a major problem in the school, culturally, or in terms of reducing our grade point averages overall, or just being a, a problem for those kids and, and having them be really unhappy because they were failing everything. So uh, we took a look at their grades. Uh, there were 48 new students to our school, about 650. And that, for us, that was a lot. And um, Math is where they were doing the most, most poorly, in geometry and algebra. Even if they had taken it elsewhere and passed the course, they still didn't seem to know as much as our students, or there were huge gaps in their knowledge. And for anybody who has struggled in math or felt lost in a math class, it's a really unpleasant feeling. And our, those students who were new to our school were feeling it, and it was causing them then to fail in all sorts of other areas. They were just, like that was the rock that was, that was causing them to sink to the bottom of the lake was math performance. So I didn't have extra time from teachers to devote to this. So I needed to think of another solution. And so what we did was we decided to take them out of a class that they were taking that was more of a specials or an electives class that was like three hours a week. They usually would fail it anyway because they were new to North Star and were having trouble adjusting. So we took them all out of that 
all 48 of these new students. And then we overlaid that with um, students who happened to have a study hall because of their, usually it was because they were taking four or five AP classes and some of those were lab sciences which had an odd number of hours or they were in calculus which was seven hours a week. So they ended up having salted around their schedule these random hours of study hall. And that was fine for them to have some, but my thinking was, let's find just one. Each of them, each of our high-performing juniors and seniors, let's see if they have one study hall when they could tutor a student in math. And so we just overlaid these two things, and sure enough, uh, at every time when I pulled these students out of their classes, we had some juniors and seniors who were high-performing, great kids, who I thought would be able to do this. And then I promised them it would go on their transcript as a math teaching assistant or math tutor. And that was attractive to them, because anything more that they can get on their resume or college application is what they're going to do. So, uh, and then I devoted a quarter of my time, uh, or one quarter, second quarter this year, about seven hours a week for me just to supervise this. And so we just put the two students together. If they hadn't, the trick was, if they hadn't had math yet, they had no materials because all of our homework is turned in first thing in the morning. So we just spoke to teachers about providing the materials for that lesson and an answer key, which they do anyway for their own benefit, and providing both of those to us so that the tutor would have the answering key for the day's lesson and the students would have the lesson. And in fact, usually they would see that class the very next period. So they would spend an hour with a junior or senior going through exactly what they were going to see just a few minutes later, and it was just the best thing. Uh, we told the upperclassmen to withhold as much knowledge for as long as possible during these sessions, to be not very helpful. Uh, counterintuitively, uh, that was actually the best thing for the students, so that they would struggle a little bit. So we would tell the tutors, set the timer for 10 minutes, don't answer any questions for the first 10 minutes, everybody's to work independently. You should just read the answer key, make sure you understand all the material. And then we, they would go up and they, they see their teachers do it all the time. They'd go up and set the timer, 10 minutes, everybody would work. And then they would just, all the tutors would just break them into small groups of three and four. And they'd say, okay, what's number one? And they, and they hold the answer key tight, tightly to their chest and not reveal any of it. And, and then I would model for them how to ask questions rather than tell, because that's not helpful. And they would go through this with the students. Uh, three times a week. And if they had already had the math class, sometimes the tutorials happen at the end of the day, they had the homework. So they would have the lesson materials from that day in their possession. They would have the homework. Again, they'd set the timer, not help them. And then after uh, 10 minutes or so, then the students would tutor them through it. And it was just the best thing. The, the, it was a great transfer of positive school culture from the upperclassmen to the new students so they could see how focused we were on academics. Um, their grades rose, and we told all the new students that we would replace their terrible first quarter grades with their new second quarter grades that were the result of this tutorial. So they had a huge incentive to um, do better. And then for the parents of the new students who were just furious at me for how poorly their students were doing, at their new school, we had an answer. You know, we had something to say other than just persevere. It was, hey, I've taken them out of an entire class, <laughs> so they don't have to do that, and I've paired them up with these great upperclassmen for three hours a week, and I'm monitoring it. Like, I'm monitoring the, how this whole thing goes, and it's going really well. And what we saw was that the students felt supported by the school, they had a new friend who was an upperclassman, or friends, because these were groups of like seven and eight kids. And, um, it, and it turned out that that's exactly what they needed. They needed somebody to pay attention to their math gaps. And their teachers just couldn't in a, in a big class of 25, 27, 30 kids. They couldn't do it. But yet, here were these upperclassmen, who were then also had more responsibility and were empowered. And I think they felt equally good about the relationship. I wish that more schools would focus on designing problem-solving systems to help students succeed rather than relying on just the personalities of individual teachers. Uh, in, in too many of the schools right, that I visit, teachers have a lot of autonomy that they're using 
for, to make choices for themselves, not necessarily what is going to maximize the performance of the students in their classroom. So I, and, and for people who want to come to North Star, we do warn them, there's not as much autonomy here as in a lot of places, but it's by design. It's that we have designed lesson plans which are, which are highly rigorous and very tight in terms of how we use minutes. Those are what we want to have taught. And to somebody who's coming in new to our school, if they don't want to do that, they shouldn't come here. After a year or two of being here, then they are more involved with how the curriculum is, is designed, how the lesson plans are put together. But it is still a very efficient model. And that, I think, should be more prevalent because I think a lot of schools are missing out by giving teachers too much autonomy for no reason other than for the teacher's benefit. And that's, what not, that's not what schools are supposed to be. Schools are supposed to focus on what's best for students. Aside from the SAT, the other project that I really want to devote more time to is helping our students to get out of our school more in terms of doing more research in labs and at universities that are near us. I think our students need to get out of our building and interact with graduate students and professors on an even larger scale. Right now, we really only have about a dozen students doing individual research projects with professors. We have another 20 students doing some biological research sessions at Rutgers. I want it to be 100, 200 students. Because at Denver School of Science Technology, or at um, Noble Street, or at Bergen County Academies here in New Jersey, they have kids going out into the community, working at the coroner's office, participating in autopsies, going to hospitals, learning how to do surgery, uh, working with microscopy units, working with, st with stem cells and um, nanotechnology. Like that's what, our, that's what we want our kids, our students to be able to do. They're ready to do it. We're just not networked in the way that upper middle class families are that kind of are able to provide those opportunities to their high school students through their relationships. We have to invent it and engineer it. But that's what we are doing.